So differential forms in R3, you have a zero form, which is a function. You have a one form, which looks like this. Again, A, B, and C would be functions. You have a two form. Oh, I've written it in the... Oh, no. Let me fix this. Sorry, guys. Do, 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 do. I wanted to write beta equals to something like, let's say, a dy wedge dz plus b dz wedge dx plus c dx wedge dy. Again, a, b, c being functions. And then a three form, something like gamma, some function g dx wedge dy wedge dz. Of course, that's the top form, right? So these are your these are your differential forms in R three. Now in R three, of course, we've studied multivariate calculus, and we know that we have thing we have vector fields, right? And so vector fields naturally correspond either to one forms or two forms here. In particular, we define. Um, I don't think this is in O'Neill, but uh, maybe in homework it says something. I don't know. So this is called the work form. This would be I use omega. Um, a, B, C, like so, and this would be the flux form, phi of A, B, C. All right, and the work form and the flux form have really, really cool properties. First of all, they're isomorphisms. If, if we fix a point, I should say. I mean, they're bijective correspondence between vector fields and one forms, or between vector fields and two forms. If I fixed a point, then I could say it's an isomorphism. Um, in terms of vector spaces, but uh, I should be careful. I mean, these are functions. This is, doesn't have a vector space structure. It is a module structure because the, the sort of the field here is functions, which is, of course, a ring. You don't, um, you can have the product of two non-zero functions be zero, and yet, and yet, and yet, neither of the functions be zero. So there's zero divisors in the ring of functions. It's not a field. Anyway, um, that aside, these work form correspondence have very, very, very cool um, properties. Proper, yeah, good job, properties. So, and I invite you to prove these. These are good homework exercises, but first of all, if I have omega A wedged with omega B vectors, right, I actually get the flux form of A cross B. So in this sense, the wedge product in, uh, encodes the cross product. Also, if we take the wedge product of omega A, omega B, omega C, well, what I get then is uh, I get the triple product. I get A dot D cross C dx wedge dy wedge dz. So there's a triple product is naturally encoded by these wedge products. And another thing, the dot product you can get like this. If I take omega a and I wedge it with the flux form of b, that gives me a dot b um, dx wedge dy wedge dz. Those are all straightforward exercises I leave to the reader. Now, the other beautiful thing um, for differential forms in R3 is just what the exterior derivative does. So, exterior differentiation is also very nice. Of course, we talked about uh, for a function, right? For a function f, df, right, is what? It's well, it's partial f partial x dx plus partial f partial y dy partial f partial z dz. Of course, what is that? Well, this is exactly the work form corresponding to the vector. Let's see, you get partial xf, partial yf, partial zf. Well, what is that? Well, that, that's, that's the work form of the gradient of f, right? So the exterior derivative of a one of a function gives me back the 
one form corresponding to the gradient. If alpha um, is, you know, um, a one form, so let's base alpha is the one form corresponding to the vector field f, you can work it out, but d alpha turns out to be a two form. What a two form is it? It's actually the flux form of the curl of f. So that's very neat. The exterior derivative of a one form uh, gives us a two form, and that two form corresponds to the curl of the corresponding vector field. For a two form, let's say phi corresponding to g d beta, well, that's got to be a three form, so you need a scalar function in front. What scalar function is it? It's exactly the divergence of g. It works out divergence of g dx wedge dy wedge dz. Now these things I'm claiming they're all simple to work out and I leave you the I will leave to you the joy of working these out explicitly. It's really really fun. Now I should mention d squared equals to zero is important here again. So how does well I guess I can do it anyway. d squared equals to zero what does that say? What does d squared equals to zero mean in this context? Well, let's see here. For example, d, um, so we can calculate the second derivative, well, second exterior derivative of f, and that will be d of, that? that's d of omega gradient of f, right? Okay, well, if you believe these things, then that's the flux form of the curl of the gradient of f. Now remember, the flux form is a bijective correspondence, and so if this is equal to zero, that implies that the gradient, curl the gradient is zero. Of course, we know that identity from calculus three. And another thing I can take the second exterior derivative of is a one form. So d of d alpha, let's say. So, oh, but to make it more apparent what this means in terms of vector calculus, let's say that that's d of omega sub, let's see here, f, okay? And so, that would be d of the flux form of the curl of f. Alright. And so that is the divergence of the curl of f. Right? But, again, d squared is equal to zero, so that's equal to zero. That implies that the divergence of the curl is zero. Also, an important identity from vector calculus. So that, in a nutshell, is the, um, you know, some of the, the most, I think, interesting bits about differential forms in R3. Uh, we will be working with differential forms in R3 all this semester, so, I mean, you'll, you'll see more. Let me just do one more calculation, and then I'll call it quits here. I don't think I have anything more in my notes. All right, so seven. One of the things that originally tracked me to differential forms altogether was this calculation I'm about to show you. So, if uh, just a, you know an example about why differential forms are so interesting, if I have x equals to let's say r cosine theta, if I have y is equal to r sine theta, well then we can calculate dx is cosine theta dr minus r sine theta d theta, we can calculate dy is sine theta dr um, plus r cosine theta d theta. So then if I calculate dx wedge dy, I can trade that for what? Well, I can trade that for cosine theta. dr minus r sine theta d theta wedged with sine theta dr plus r cosine theta d theta. Okay, great. Well, that gives me sine theta, cosine theta. Um, let's see here. We're, I've got a well, dr wedge dr. Um, let's see here. I really need to write that. The dr wedge dr is automatically zero, right? So why bother writing that? But oh well, I did. And then plus r cosine squared theta dr wedge d theta minus r sine squared theta d theta wedge dr and then plus, I'll, I'll write it down since I wrote the other one down uh, r sine theta cosine theta d 
theta wedge d theta. Of course, d theta wedge d theta is zero. dr wedge dr is zero. And on the other hand, this is minus dr wedge d theta. So these terms combine to give me r times sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta dr wedge d theta, which of course simplifies to r dr wedge d theta. Of course, you should recognize this as being, so this is basically like the, um, the area element, right? And this is the area element in polar coordinates. So the wedge product in exterior differentiation naturally encodes um, the Jacobians that you expect. And also, the other nice thing about the, the, the wedge product is it, it, it can tell the difference between dx wedge dy versus dy wedge dx, right? I might think about this as being sort of like an area with an upward normal versus I could think about that as everything else being the same downward normal, right? As you can see, that's that. Now, we talk about things like double integrals, right, of f dx dy. Now, there's, there's no wedge product in there because really those integrals over, you know, bounded regions in the plane, they're not, they're not oriented, right? I mean, they're really just, uh, there's no sense of orientation in those sets in this integration. It's, um, so there's two competing sort of kinds of integration you can think about. There's integrations which are oriented and there, there's those which aren't. And uh, I would say the double integral um, that we study in Calculus 3 is not oriented, yeah. whereas the surface integral we talk about later is with respect to a a choice of outward normal or some normal at least for the surface we can do integrals over. So the wedge product is a natural candidate for things that you want to encode orientations for, right? And uh, I hope you can forgive me for writing wedges everywhere. I know O'Neill omits these wedges many places, but I, I prefer to keep them in just to be to be explicit. Anyway, I think that is the end of lecture three. Lecture four we will pick back up soon. Thank you.